at 6.50 p.m. Red Max rang the doorbell of 35 to 36 Little Newport Street. The lodging of a petite French brunette, unnervingly similar to the other three victims, who was known as French Suzette. He didn't wear a disguise or bring a weapon, as Max's power was his stranglehold on Soho. A place so in fear, he could kill in plain sight and disappear into a busy city street as no one dared to speak his name. Unlocked by the prostitute's terrified maid, as with Fifi, Marie and Leia, the street door led up a tight stair as his heavy boots thudded up to this soon-to-be crime scene of another killing. By the time the police would arrive, the room would be cleaned, the evidence erased, the witnesses silenced, and the killer unseen. Many have speculated that the Soho Strangler wasn't the work of a sadistic serial killer or a series of copycat killings, but a white slaver sending a message to his pimps, girls and ponces. And now, just a few streets south of the murders of Fifi, Marie and Leia, a rival crime boss was dead. Roger Marcel Vernon was born on the 4th of January 1901 in Fontenay-sur-Bois, a pleasant suburb on the outskirts of Paris. His father was a postal official, his mother was a housewife, and coming from a good hard-working family, although he was educated and cultured, Roger wanted more. Nicknamed Petit Georges, Owing to his small stature, Roger was a thin, slightly built man, barely five foot high in heels, who wore very expensive, exquisitely tailored suits to hide the fact that they were child-sized. And although, with dark, slicked down hair, a flawless face, and often wearing a natty little bow tie, many mistook him for a little boy dressed in his Sunday best, when in truth, he was an angel-faced killer. Like a little Highland Terrier, Roger could be calm, loyal, and intensely smart. But burdened by a short fuse, sharp teeth, and a savage bite, very few rats ever escaped a tussle with Roger unscathed. We know little about his descent into crime, as he used the cover of running cafes to hide the truth from the authorities and his parents. In July 1920, 19-year-old Roger was bound over for theft. In April 1922, he served two years for larceny, and later for larceny with force. At Villain Assizes in November 1924, he was sentenced to seven years hard labor and 10 years banishment to the infamous Devil's Island. Harsher than any sentence and harder than any prison, Devil's Island was one of the most brutal penal colonies in the world. Opened in 1852, Devil's Island was an uninhabited and isolated strip of land, 10 miles off the French Guyana coast of South America. Surrounded on all sides by swirling seas, owing to the heat, the disease, and the brutality of the warders, it was nicknamed the Dry Guillotine. As 40% of the prisoners didn't survive their first year, 
and 75% would die before their sentence was even complete. To endure such brutality requires strength and patience. And although Roger was half the weight and size of most prisoners, he lasted three years in near solitary confinement before he finally broke. Few prisoners have ever escaped Devil's Island, but one was Roger Vernon. On the 15th of November 1927, having built in secret and silence a makeshift raft, stockpiled supplies, and concocted an almost suicidal plan, eight convicts over cover of night navigated the black stormy seas, escaping 10 miles west to Venezuela. As one of the most daring prison breaks ever, it caused a national embarrassment for the French. And although they unleashed a worldwide manhunt to capture him, dead or alive, Roger was never caught. From Venezuela, where he met his wife-to-be, he fled to New York. And in the Broadway cafe, he brought a French-Canadian passport under the alias of Charles Edward Lacroix a native of Montreal, born five years before himself, and blessed with dual nationality. This gave him access to Canada, France, and Britain. It is unknown how and when Roger Vernon, alias Charles Lacroix, became a white slaver. But seeing himself, not as a small-time pimp or a ponce, but as the boss, he was unafraid to get his hands dirty and to send a clear message to any rivals that he was not to be messed with. On Monday the 30th of June 1930, Henri Bouclier, a 60-year-old Belgian known as Old Martigues, the slang name for the French coastal town of Marseille, left his wealthy apartment on Dorches Street West in downtown Montreal and the epicenter of the Red Light District. Described as a vice czar, Henri was a drug dealer and an international white slaver who wore sharp suits and always dripped in gold jewellery. Henri was the boss of Montreal's criminal underworld. But losing his grip, new gangs had muscled in. Police struggled to find any witnesses, and the statements they made were vague. But it was said that Henri was picked up by a black car of unknown make, by two men of unseen description, and driven away. Missing for three days, on the afternoon of the 2nd of July, in a remote disused industrial site called Lavelle Solar Lac, an 11-year-old boy found his bloated, bullet-riddled body just a few yards from a barely used road. Fully dressed except for his hat, his pockets were emptied, his ID was burned, and his jewellery was stolen so that now everyone could see that this once great man had nothing because he was nothing. With no bloodstains at the scene, tire marks told the detectives that he had been murdered elsewhere, driven to this spot, dragged off the road and dumped within view. Being easy to find but hard to identify, his killers knew that speculation would grow, and once his death was reported, that the message would be clear. 
examined by the police surgeon. Henri was shot while standing in a close range. With the first bullet smashing his gold teeth into pieces and embedding into the back of his neck. And the second, breaking his ribs and skewering his right lung as he drowned in great gasps of breath of his own blood. Police interrogated their prime suspects. Roger Vernon and Rafa, a fellow escapee from Devil's Island, for eight hours about the murder of Montreal's Vicar. But with no evidence, they were released. With Henri dead, Roger assumed control of parts of his criminal empire. And even today, the murder of Henri Bouglier remains unsolved. Across the early 1930s, Roger moved between America, Spain, Belgium, London and Paris, establishing brothels and trafficking women into sex work, with his wife set up as a front by running an honest café. The white slave trade was big business. It was said that a new attractive young girl, preferably a virgin, could trade hands for 500 pounds. That's 31,000 pounds today. And having added her travel fees, her rent, her clothes, and a sham marriage, each girl would be imprisoned by a pimp's debt. And living in a code of silence, with nothing written as paper leaves a trail. Each of these contracts would be etched in fear, bruises and blood. By the mid-1930s, Scotland Yard still struggled to smash this Soho vice ring and to prove who the boss of each rival syndicate really was. But often, this person was so invisible it was almost as if he didn't exist. As a legal citizen with no criminal record in Britain, on the 21st of October 1931 at Hoban Registry Office, using the alias of Charles Edward Lacroix, Roger Vernon married Esther Ode, a former French prostitute. And using the cover that he was a car dealer, with modest lodgings on Grafton Street, he blended in. Seen as a small businessman living a seemingly modest life, Roger kept a low profile from the law as he ruled great swathes of the West End sex trade with an iron fist, roughing up the meat when they stepped out of line, attacking any pimps who skimmed off the top and stamping on any rival who muscled in. In 1933, Roger moved his mistress, a petite French prostitute with rosebud lips and a brunette bob, known as French Suzette, into a two-floor lodging at 35 to 36 Little Newport Street, just south of Soho. where Red Max the Strangler would be murdered. Fear pervades every element of the white slave trade, from prostitutes to pimps, kingpins to ponces, and even those ordinary people who perform simple tasks to aid their daily life. Marcel Gabriel Aubin, made to French Rosette, would state, Roger had lent a man called Emile Allard, 25 pounds, to furnish a prostitute's flat and had not paid it back. He did not like this man. He was a big bully who was known to threaten women and to make those he disliked 
pay by violent means. Two days prior, Red Max paid Suzanne a visit at the flat, while Roger was away on business in France. Scaring Suzanne and mocking Roger, what was said by Max was unrecorded, but Roger was said to be fuming. On Wednesday the 22nd of January, one day before, a letter was sent to Red Max. It read, Will you call at the flat tomorrow, between 6.30pm and 7, as I have a letter to hand to you personally? It was signed, Suzanne. Posted that day and received the next morning, the trap was set. But what was the motive? There were two witnesses to the murder and disposal of Red Max, but both were in fear for their lives. 45-year-old Marcelo Ban had been Suzanne's maid for just eight months. In her first statement to the police, she would deny everything, stating, Roger wasn't there. There was no fight. I broke the window fixing a light and Madame only left as her mother was sick. Promise protection. This terrified woman later admitted, I did not tell you the truth because I am frightened that someone might injure me. The second witness was Pierre Alexander, a driver and garage owner of 21 Sutton Street in Soho who was also an associate of Roger Vernon, a known Ponce who the police suspected was a flat farmer with links to white slavery, and who was also the landlord of 35 to 36 Little Newport Street, where the murder took place. In his first statement, he too denied it all, stating, I don't know Suzanne. I have seen her with a small Frenchman, but I don't know his name. I have not seen Red Max in months, and I was not at the flat that night. He would later admit, I did not tell the truth as I was afraid. I held him through fear, and because he said that I had to. But that's the power of fear. It can make witnesses silent, and even murders seem like suicides. Thursday the 23rd of January 1936 was an ordinary day by all accounts. When the maid arrived, Suzanne and Roger were still in bed and then she made them both breakfast. On the sideboard, in the top floor sitting room, Marcel saw a small pistol, a .25 Colt automatic, along with a tin of 18 bullets. At 6.50 p.m., having rang the doorbell, Marcel nervously showed Max up the stairs. At Roger's request, Suzanne hid in the second floor bedroom, later joined by Marcel. And in the third floor sitting room, instead of meeting Suzanne as he thought, Red Max met Roger Vernon, who was still seething. What words were exchanged between the two bitter rivals would go with both of them to their graves. Whether a debt was repaid or insults were spat is unknown as with the radio at a volume that was too loud to be pleasant. It could be said that this was premeditation, as was the loaded pistol in Roger's pocket. 
as a tiny man with a childlike frame. Although quick-tempered and dangerous, Roger was no match for Red Max. A thuggish brute who could strangle this tiny man with one hand. And Roger knew that. Marcel recalled, Soon after he went up, I heard quarreling, footsteps back and forth, and while high words were being spoken, then I heard some shots. There were several. I heard a scuffle, and then Roger shouted, Marcel, as both women rushed up the stairs to the aid of this tiny man. Max had me by the throat, Roger would claim. He was trying to strangle me, only with no bruises to his neck. All he had was a cut to his lip, as this lump of a man stumbled about, bleeding profusely. Five shots were fired in total. The first penetrated both sides of his right hand as he tried to defend his face. The second and third ripped into his stomach with both bullets buried in his right leg and back. A fourth fired from the side, burst through his hip and his right kidney and shot from behind as he stumbled. A fifth skewered his right shoulder and breaking three ribs as he slowly drowned in his own blood. Stubbornly still standing and trying to flee, when Marcel and Suzanne arrived, Red Max would growl, Oh, mademoiselle, he has shot me. As the cruel white slaver whined about his own impending demise. pushing the lumbering lump back into the room. When he got near the window, Marcel would say. With his forearm, he smashed two panes of glass. And although she would state, Suzanne and I pulled him away from the window, several witnesses did refuse to speak or told to the police. But many more, who had no links to drugs, crime or white slavery, openly spoke of the shots they heard and the falling glass. Their statements would prove pivotal. But oddly, not a single person had called the police. In the bathroom, on the second floor, as blood and stomach bile pulled about his crumpled legs. Max pleaded, take me to the hospital. As this terrifying monster, who had subjected thousands of girls to an unspeakable horror of being repeatedly raped by drunken men, begged, I'm going to die. Give me some water. But as he struggled to breathe, Gasping, air, air. Roger simply barked at him. Shut up. With bullet wounds to his stomach and kidney, the pain would have been agonizing as it took him half an hour to die. As slowly, this once feared crime boss bled dry, slumped at the base of a toilet. Red Max the Strangler had been murdered. But with enough power and money, even a big man could be made to vanish. Pierre, it's Roger. Come round at once. Bring a car.
backing up his black Chrysler 66, a four-seater saloon to the street door at 11.20 p.m. Pierre saw the body and went white, both in shock and fear. With the street still trickling with curious faces, but no police, they waited until 3.30 a.m. when the club had shut and the street lamps had gone out, plunging the whole area into darkness. Throughout the night, Suzanne and I washed away the bloodstains, Marcel would later confess. They washed the walls, scrubbed the carpets, and erased any trace of Max from every surface. When Roger came in, he said, There's a spot there and there. He wasn't happy until every spot of blood had gone. Into the fire, everything Max had on him when he died was burnt. His letters, his ID, his passport, his tie, his collar, and even his trilby hat. His money was taken and his jewellery was stripped. So that when found, everyone would see that this once great man had nothing because he was nothing. The window was repaired, the curtains were burnt, the pistol was dumped, and the spent cartridges were slung down a drain. Even a passing policeman would be none the wiser. At 4am, with a foggy frost having descended onto this cobblestone street, Amidst the gloom, a 16-stone lump wrapped in a brown blanket was dragged down the stairs and bundled into the back of Pierre's car. Ordered by Roger to go to the country, this makeshift hearse headed 25 miles north to St Albans. Sneaking down, unlit lanes through an impenetrable fog. Pierre later said, After wandering a while, we went down a little turning and Roger said, Here is a good place. Pulling up quietly and dragging the body by its feet across the hard frosty grass so his once fine suit was ragged and torn like a penniless pauper like rubbish. He was dumped between a hedge on a barely used road in an isolated spot. It wasn't hidden, but that was the point. Roger wanted the body to be found, bereft of life and stripped of wealth. As the speculation grew, once Red Max's death was reported, the message would be clear. Just as it was with Henri Bouclier. By the morning, as a passerby found a bloodied, bullet-riddled body, Roger and Suzanne boarded a boat train to Paris Reassured that the flat was clean, the evidence was destroyed, and the witnesses silenced. The murder of Red Max could easily have gone unsolved, as many other murders had. But as much as a kingpin has the power to make a mere minion too terrified to talk, and erase them if they do, there is nothing more intimidating than a police detective who can arrest you, deport you, and convict you. With the body identified later that day as Maya Cassell, alias Red Max, although the press made spurious claims over the dead man's identity based on hearsay, the police investigated the crime using the most logical methods known. An autopsy confirmed his fingerprints, 
with no criminal record, they liaised with the French police. In his list of known associates was Roger Vernon, who was missing. As was his mistress, a convicted prostitute known as French Suzette, who lived at 35 to 36 Little Newport Street. When questioned, local witnesses spoke of shouting, glass smashing and gunshots. Inside, although the flat was spotless, fingerprints were found, as well as a few tiny blood spots. A witness at the King's Head pub next door had seen and heard Red Max struggling to breathe in the bathroom. And speaking to the neighbours, they were able to trace two terrified witnesses who demanded protection to speak. On Saturday the 1st of February, just nine days later, at a hotel in Port Saint-Denis in Paris, the Surete would charge Charles Lacroix and Marguerite Ferrero, alias Roger Vernon and Suzanne Bertrand, with willful murder. With both suspects French, the inquest began on Monday the 3rd of February at Paris Assizes in France. The evidence against Roger Vernon was solid. Only one key witness, who had seen everything, was missing. As may have happened with French Fifi and the white slavers it was said she helped to convict. Before the trial, a petite French brunette and a prostitute's maid called Marcel Aubin was found dead. Investigated thoroughly, an autopsy would confirm it wasn't a murder or a suicide, but that this healthy, 45-year-old woman had succumbed to a mysterious illness. In court, the tiny crime boss in his natty little bow tie poo-pooed evidence, dismissed lawyers, and tried to tie up the court in knots by denying that he was Roger Vernon and that the murder of a rival had taken place. Turning against his mistress and hanging her out to dry, as he shouted, liar, every time she condemned him, Roger spat, I swear that I do not know Max Cassell and that I had nothing to do with his death. Roger Vernon was a big time criminal and a feared gangster. And although tough and devious, calm and controlling, and a man who wrought fear upon a city, the prosecution knew how to get to him. Not evidence. Not a new witness, but his beloved 74-year-old father, who scolded his son like this little boy truly was, shouting, You unhappy boy, you grind our name into the mud. You must tell the truth. And with that, Roger Vernon, the international drug dealer and infamous white slaver, who ruled large swathes of Soho sex trade, fell to his knees and sobbed. On the 29th of April 1937, at Seine Assizes in Paris, Suzanne Bertrand was acquitted. Pierre Alexander gave his damning evidence and then fled the country fearing his own life and found guilty of willful murder. 36-year-old Roger Marcel Vernon was sentenced to 10 years hard labor and banished for 20 years. It could be said that Roger Vernon was a likely suspect to be the Soho Strangler. But he was never suspected, as before the brutal murders of Marie Cotton and Dutch Leia, 
he was already in prison. With three women dead, the killing stopped, the panic over, and the press having ceased writing silly stories about a serial strangler in Soho, slaying similar-looking women with links to the sex trade. With their focus on the looming war in Europe, the excitement had died down, and the case was forgotten. Part 9 of 10 of The Soho Strangler continues next week. Christ! Oh, that's going to be a long episode. Bloody hell. But, hope you're enjoying it. Oh, cripes! Lordy, lordy, up on high. It's pissing down outside. I was slightly racing to get that done because it's pissing down. I'm gonna take your little hat off. There you go, hope that's better. Um, it's pissing down outside. It's been snowing a bit today. I, I know people in Scotland have had it, had it, had lots of snow coming down. We had, oh, we had at least a quarter of an inch. Oh, should be grateful if you get a quarter of an inch. <laughs> oh, um, Hello everyone, welcome to Extra Mile, unscripted, unedited, blah blah blah, new people, we tell details about the case, this is, I, I don't edit this bit so it's all a bit of a mess, we do quiz in a bit and I make a tea, I think I'll make a tea, yes let's make a tea, or shall I have a coffee, what do you reckon, tea or coffee, I think it's too late for a coffee, it is, I haven't got my watch on so I don't know, let's pop the, um, let's pop, I'll have a tea, I'll have a tea, oh my leg's gone to sleep, I was sitting on my leg and it's gone to sleep. Oh, what's going on? Uh, let's put that there. Um, what's going on in the world? Lots of stuff. Um, I've managed to, uh, my water filter broke on my boat. So luckily I'm near a water point. So I'm filling up from the water point, but I can't switch on my taps at the moment, which is a pain in the ass. Um, I went out with my, my sheared off water filter. I took it around all the chandleries and it, it was apparently it was discontinued about 15 years ago. So I had to buy a new one and I don't know whether it will fit. It's the curse of living on a boat. Nothing is standard. Like with cars, there's like, you'll notice with cars, they all kind of look about the same size. Even small cars look quite big now. It's because there's only five types of chassis in the world. There's pretty much all made by the same company. With boats, people make their own shit. So it's, oh, it's like when you got fittings, I took my fitting out. This is boring. I took my fitting out, my filter, um, pipe fitting to B&Q and I showed it to them and they look, they look disgusted. They were like, what the F is that? They didn't know what it was and they refused to acknowledge me. So there we go. I'm going to put my hat on because it's bloody cold out. Um, what else is going on? I um, uh, had the fire on the last couple of nights. It's been very nice and toasty. Looking forward to the fire not being on anymore. Um, going back on my diet again because uh i've got fat again uh eva's decided that she even though i i'm kind of nice and when i'm nice and fat she can use me as kind of a nice place you know when when i'm at her feet making little whimpering noises which is where i belong and she puts her feet on me to warm her feet up me being nice and fat fat is good but now she now she needs me a little bit fit and healthy so i could get her drinks faster you know she doesn't like it when i'm late with her drinks so uh yeah going back on the diet soon um what else is going on just bought loads of new mugs so if you uh, um haven't got any police constable arsenal guinnesses anymore i don't think i have any blackout ripper ones anymore but i just because i haven't got space to store them all burpees so i've got some stay safe eat cake mugs and uh some uh reg christie ones so i've got quite a few of those so if you if you fancy you can go to the website uh go into the links below uh and uh treat yourself treat yourself if you fancy it you, you get loads of goodies with it i've got some beer mats in there some uh, fridge magnets badges stickers key rings a, a, a personalized handwritten thank you card from me as well I'm one of these people who writes it out full. I don't just print them off and then and then sign my name. Or get someone else to sign my name. I do it all myself. Personalised letter. Uh, let's pop that there. So, let that stew for a second. I tell you what, let's have it strong. I'm going to leave the tea bag in. I'm going to let it stew. 
here. Oh, right, coming back, coming back, coming back. Right, oh, let's put the uh, pillow behind my back so I'm a little bit nearer. Um, of course, don't forget, uh, each month I do a competition uh, and you win different things if you're a patron subscriber it's only for patron subscribers so become a patron subscriber it's just three dollars a month is, is the lowest tier you get a lot of goodies for that but also you get entered into a competition first competition 40 people entered to it then it started going down and then <laughs> just before christmas i did a competition uh, where you could win three prizes and uh, 10 people entered it so there you go your chances of winning are pretty high. Sometimes it's a mug, sometimes it's just other goodies, but they're all good. Uh, big thank you to new Patreon supporters. I've written Perry on here. Don't know why I've written that. Um, thank you to Gary Linklater, uh, Miss Peggy, and Banana Pants. There you go. Gary, thank you. Uh, Miss Peggy, thank you. Banana Pants, thank you. There you go. Thank you for becoming a patron supporter. You get loads of goodies, uh, lo loads of different things that I won't show anyone else. They 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 literally stay in Patreon. I know sometimes people do, um, they do their Patreon stuff and then a week later they'll post it out there. I do with the videos, but it's only because uh, YouTube are utter assholes, and it's hard to keep things secret on youtube so uh i have to do it that way but pretty much everything else like crime scene photos they don't go anywhere they just stay on patreon and there's a whole archive of them now also there's walk with me there's about 160 episodes of walk with me uh which we've like extra mile it's it's kind of like that except i'm going for a walk sometimes uh what else is on there lots of lots of lots of good stuff so there we go right let's do some quiz questions uh so get ready 10 questions i haven't edited this episode yet so don't forget i might edit that bit relating to that question out of the episode probably might be because this feels like it's going to be quite a long episode uh or uh i think that's it that's or or i might cock it up when we go through the next bit so let's do that now okay uh, question number one what was roger's middle name Question number two, what jobs did his parents do? Question number three, what was Roger's nickname? Question number four, what age was he when he was first convicted? Question number five, when was Devil's Island opened? Question number six, what percentage of prisoners died in Devil's Island before their sentence was complete? Question seven, how long was Roger in Devil's Island before he escaped? Question number eight, what country did he... <sighs> Question number eight, what country did the prison escapees flee to? Question number nine, Henri Bouclier, the Canadian white slaver known as Old Martigues. But what does that name make reference to? So Henri Bouclier, the Canadian white slaver, was known as Old Martigues. But what does that name make reference to? And question number 10. What was the name of Roger's fellow escapee from Devil's Island and the other person suspected in the killer killing of Henri Bouclier? Uh, because... Uh, um, that's, yeah, that's my French impression. Uh, because... Uh, um, so, so very much what I wanted to get across with this episode is this is all about fear this is uh, an episode about fear and intimidation and how if you have money and power you can make things disappear so so was the soho strangler a crime boss that's the kind of whole idea with last week's episode and this week's episode so uh but i thought in this bit we'll try and dive into some more details uh, as i was writing it because there's a lot to pack into this episode this could have been a two-parter but because it hasn't really got enough to fill out two episodes i put it all in one episode but you know there's there's a lot to cover i really went into full details into the kind of the murder of red max so uh we'll dive into some extra stuff about that as you can see a lot about the relationship between suzanne and uh roger here uh that he's coming back and forth between paris and brussels and london all the time he's traveling around a lot he doesn't seem to have a place to settle except here at this point he doesn't i think he's separated from his wife they seem to have gone their separate ways after a short marriage uh, they're both in bed the maid makes some breakfast she goes suzanne goes out and picks up some men uh, which is kind of her thing even though she's the mistress of the crime 
crime boss, she's still working as a prostitute. So it kind of begs the question about their relationship, how how kind of close it is, whether he's just kind of using it, we don't know. Um, we definitely know that he uh, he had the uh, the Colt automatic pistol with him. Uh, it was shown to the maid just before he'd had it. He'd actually got it in the flat. I think it was about 10 days before. So there's a lot of premeditation here that's going on. Um, Mac, Mac, they'd sent, obviously sent the letter to Red Max, signed by Suzanne. It was actually uh, the maid who wrote it, because I don't think Suzanne could write in English, but the maid could. Uh, the maid uh, was originally married to an Irishman. I, I've got a whole thing about her back history, but uh, we didn't need to use it in the episode, so I didn't use it. But I know all about her life and where she came from. So she wrote it, signed it from Suzanne, sent it to Red Max to his P.O. box. He picked it up that day. Uh, expecting to come over and see Suzanne, uh, alias French Suzette. But clearly, uh, when he came through the door and went upstairs, Suzanne was in the bedroom and Red Max then saw Roger Vernon and clearly wasn't expecting him. But Roger Vernon had the radio on and the music was up high. Uh, as mentioned, there was lots of witnesses outside. Uh, Sophie Levy, who ran the small tobacco kiosk, was literally at the side of the entrance door to number 36. She worked from 8am to 8pm. She was there all day. She was the one who heard glass glass coming down on top of her. Um, and she even knew Suzanne as well, because Suzanne used to purchase her cigarettes from Sophia as well. So uh, she knew she was a prostitute. I think that the two of them conversed slightly in broken English. So she knew her. People knew her and uh, they didn't really seem to know Roger Vernon. In fact, most people, I had to change it in the statements in here because Roger Vernon, a lot of people call him George because he's his nickname. He goes by um, his alias. I can't remember if his alias is uh, a quiz question, so we'll, we'll ignore that. Uh, but a lot of people called him George. His nickname was Petty George, of course. That may have been a quiz question. Well, there you go. See, I've, I've, I ballsed up that one by mistake. You can have that one for free. So even if you got none of them right, you can say to yourself, I got one right. Unless, unless you've forgotten it already. So there you go. Uh, yeah, so lots of people outside um, seeing what was going on. There was a piece that I had to miss to do with Red Max death only because there was a lot to cover and I didn't want to distract sometimes it's better not to distract you with too much information about what's going on elsewhere but uh, Marcel said she saw Max stumbling around covered in blood in the front room he said oh mademoiselle he has shot me um, he, Max tried to push his way out of the room but they pushed him back into the sitting room eventually he managed to make his way down to the bathroom downstairs uh, and there was a witness of what was going on so we've all we've seen the kind of the, the the slightly cowardly death of Red Max in the bathroom there. But a gentleman called Norman Story, who was barman at the King's Head pub on Gerard Street. So uh, if immediately if you go out of here, um, just to the left on the corner of uh, what is now uh, Newport Place and Gerard Street. I think it's an in, uh, Indian, re uh, Indian Chinese restaurant now. Uh, it was the one that very recently, a couple of years ago, um, there was a, a, a fire had accidentally happened in there. And uh, when fires and things like that happen in Chinatown, because it's still it's still run by triads, um, the fire brigade have a real problem getting into access to places. And they say, you know, if a building's on fire, it's because they want it on fire. If you can't get access to it, it's because they don't want you to have access to it. But because this building caught fire by accident, um, it was entirely uh, like... Uh, it wasn't a bad fire but when i turned up there there were fire engines everywhere major incident units like everything there and i was like so i spoke to someone i know who's kind of in the know there i was like what's going on is it a gas attack or something and he was like no 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 it's just this building's on fire but because we'll never get access to it ever again uh, we're going in and we're filming the whole lot it's the only the only way can they can do it because chinatown is still still full of corruption very corrupt it's uh, do you know they deal with it stuff themselves people go missing people get killed there was a, a machete attack on gerald street on a saturday a couple of years ago where a man was hacked to pieces in the middle of the street nothing we don't know anything about it it barely made it into the press we know it happened because the police issued statements saying did you see any any of this but uh, it, it's just gone all quiet it really has 
uh what else is going on da, 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 da. so yeah um the cleanup they pretty much did it uh, as, as good a cleanup as they could do um obviously each of the witnesses were there so um marcel and pierre both seemed to be terrified parcel uh, marcel went white in shock he had to have a slug of uh, johnny walker whiskey to help him kind of come around from this um marcel the maid she was desperate to kind of leave uh but roger was really insistent that she stayed there until they kind of done everything um let's go into finding the body because uh, we kind of dealt with a lot of the cover-up that was there uh let me scroll down a bit there was a little bit of a, uh an alibi that they were doing roger roger was the first to flee he kind of left uh, at about 7 40 a.m the next morning he was carrying a portmanteau which is a large traveling bag um S uh, suzanne was seen the next morning by sophia buying cigarettes and sophia said what was the matter in your place last night with the window and suzanne said she was just putting up some curtains and my elbow went through the window that was bullshit uh roger went on uh, a boat train down to new haven caught the boat to dieppe and then over to paris the next day he sent a telegram uh to suzanne she received it all it said was perfect health sat thousands of kisses just to let her know that he'd arrived safely um and then she did the same she kind of um packed up her bag and headed to paris um I was going to do a, initially I was going to do a whole section at the start about the discovery of a body and then we link it to the the later murder of Henri Bouclier uh, because uh, uh but I moved I moved the scenes around and wrote it in a different way so we learn about Henri Bouclier uh, because uh, and then the uh discovery of the body who I I kind of worked out that we we you'd already know that this was going to be Red Max anyway so um a lot of details a packed full of a lot of details but i didn't use it in the episode so um the body was found uh friday the 24th of january 1936 the next morning at about 10 a.m on the intersection between barn uh cell barns lane and hill end lane just outside st albans uh not too far but, but kind of between where both hospitals are now uh he was found behind a hedge not too far from the road literally 10 feet um from the hedge in a small field so five feet from the roadway so it was deliberate that he was going to be found uh henry sayer who was a carpenter employed by cell barnes colony cottage uh as part of the hospital he was walking by uh he said i saw a body lying behind the hedge he was lying on his back his overcoat was up around his neck his trousers were pulled halfway up his knees so it looked like he'd been dragged and the ground was hard and frosted frosty so it's burps uh so hence there was no footmarks uh he went straight to the hospital uh, which has long since been demolished uh informed them and they called the police um so cyril millman who was the deputy made medical superintendent at barnes cell barnes colony uh, went over to visit the body he said his extremities were cold but his abdomen was not yet death was not yet due death was not due to natural causes the position of the body was consistent with having been placed there after death his shoes were clean um by that point the frost had kind of um softened a bit so there was mud kind of around him but his shoes were spotlessly clean uh, when i reached the spot the ground surrounded the body he was not very muddy it had been a frosty overnight and there was still ice on the roadside uh, st albans police turned up uh they inspected they called out uh, their own doctor as well they could see that um he'd been shot at least five times he got six bullet wounds in total i mentioned those in the episode uh some of the bullets were found inside him he got two loose front front teeth lacer lacerations to his jaw body and hands uh and scars to his face and blood-stained clothes uh, um 
uh, time of death was roughly, they said, nine to 12 hours prior to discovery. So it was actually about seven o'clock. So discovery, yeah, yeah, about 15 hours. So not too far off. But don't forget, it's, it's a cold night. The temperature's changing. It's hard to kind of... T- and he would have been in a car as well, which would have been warmer. So it's kind of hard to work out. It, the temperature changes. but And uh, as we mentioned before, rigor mortis... Uh, happens at a different time if the uh, death is sudden as opposed to a slow death so um, with no ID on him they didn't know who he was but they were able to issue his description to all the different police forces around the country to, um, and to see if anyone had reported him missing um, autopsy because it was a murder was conducted by Sir Bernard Spilsbury who of course did the autopsies on all the others that was done that day at 3pm at St Albans Mortuary in the presence of Dr Ronald Wilson cause of death hemorrhage to lungs caused by bullet fired by a 22 caliber revolver uh, what else we got what else we got I won't go into the details about uh bullets because we already covered that in the episode uh he had some other injuries as well most likely caused by a fist a scratch on his right hand a small abrasion to the bridge of his nose a one and a half inch wound over his right cheekbone lacerations to his nose lips back of shoulder and kneecaps uh, that would be from dragon uh blood in the nostrils uh and the lower jaw were loose uh sorry teeth his two central incisors of his lower jaw were loose and he had bloody roots so that could be from the punching uh, so uh, by that point they really didn't know who he was at all but um max actually had a friend i didn't put this in the episode because it throws if this we would have done a, a fuller because we've already got a two-parter about red max and then it goes roger vernon if this would have been a two-parter just about red max we would have put all this in but i didn't feel it was worth it for a whole episode so uh red max had uh, a friend uh, called joe jacobs real name barra zarkowski uh was kind of they were kind of friends together but not really that close um joe jacobs had called at max's flat 37 james street the night before they kind of chatted he went around to see him the next day he knocked uh, got no reply he read in the paper that a man had been found dead in St Albans. There was a description of the man. Uh, he pieced it together. He called the police. And at 8.25pm, PC Jones... Oh, if only it was P- Police Constable Arsenal Guinness. He would kick down the door, wouldn't he? Oh, where is where is your Guinness? Um, PC Jones turned up at uh, Red Max's flat, uh, saw that he wasn't there, alerted the police that a man was missing. And there you have it. They got his fingerprints. They connected it to uh, all of his other details. Job done. Uh, if, um, I mentioned in the episode, uh, because Red Max, alias Emil Allard, didn't have a hi- uh, criminal history in the UK, because they knew that he potentially was of French origin because he, uh, he'd travelled to and from france with his passport so his passport was stamped well not his passport because that was destroyed but in his house they had kind of found details of him coming back and forth from france and connections to france so they spoke to the french police police were able to confirm that uh this was red max Cassell, alias all of his previous aliases and when they looked at his list of known associates bang there you have it red max red max sorry roger vernon um most of this we've kind of covered clean up they cleaned up as much as they could they even got in um a gentleman he didn't he 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 kind of accepted the story that they said that um that they were trying to fix a light or something and then they broke one of the windows um so he turned up and he fixed the broken window so by the time the police had turned up nothing there um it's still unknown why no one outside called the police maybe it's that kind of thing that maybe they just didn't want to get involved maybe uh, roger vernon had people out there saying if you speak you know we'll get slightly angry with you but you know it's really not known why that happened uh pierre henri alexander uh, because um he was the 
guy who was the landlord who owned the flat and he also had his garage which was over on Sutton Street that's now called Sutton Row in Soho that's just at the back of Tottenham Court Road tube station so it's it's not too far away it's literally drive wise not even a minute if that probably half a minute um before the police had hunted hunted him down he'd cleaned out the car um but it would the car would be subjected to microscopic analysis. It was taken to uh, Hendon, uh, the police laboratory, and they found minute traces of blood inside the car and on the back seat. So um, he'd obviously attempted to clean it, but had done a terrible job. Uh, it's really pissing down now outside. Uh, Saturday, the 1st of February, 1936, at an unknown hotel at Port Saint-Denis in Paris, uh, French police were already searching for Roger and Suzanne. Uh, they found an entry in a book because uh, they alerted all the hotels and all the ports and everywhere. They were really looking hard for them. And they found an entry under uh, Monsieur and Madame Lacroix. Uh, because um, they spoke to the management. They found Roger Vernon. He was just sitting in the hotel lobby. He was calmly reading a paper. They handcuffed him and the officers settled down to wait for Suzanne to return as she'd been out shopping. Uh, she turned up a couple of hours later in a black afternoon frock and an expensive mink coat coat and she walked in about 5 p.m um hotel concierge said uh they were looked like a very ordinary couple and were very well behaved it was like they were on a honeymoon they seemed so much in love with one another but were very pale but calm when they were driven away in the police car uh let's just uh i think I'm, i don't think i'm gonna do yeah i'm not gonna do much more no i'm gonna do no more because uh there's a lot there's a lot to cover and uh, we are going to do this with when we do the the nuggets the soho strangler nuggets and i'm going to go th what i'm going to do is i'm going to piece through instead of doing it like this and just reading out bits and pieces i'm really going to dive into all the different theories about this so you can kind of make the decision about wh what you feel about the soho strangler because this is going to be one of those cases where there will be a conclusion but it might not be your conclusion so this is kind of uh, how it's going to play out. Oh, Just have a swig of tea. Or oh, a strong swig of tea. I think that's uh, the, the biscuit and jam one. Um, so quiz questions. Let's see how many of them I ballsed up. Uh, question number one. What was Roger's middle name? It was Marcel. I may have balls that one up. Question number two. What jobs did his parents do? His dad was a postal official and his mother was a housewife. Question number three. What was Roger's middle name? It was Petit Georges. Uh, because... Question number four. What age was he when he was first convicted? He was 19 years old. Question number five. When, when was Devil's Island opened? Uh, it was opened in 19... Uh, it was opened in 1853. Um, but by 1938 because it was quite a controversial place uh the french had already stopped sending prisoners there uh which is why even though red max was banished for 20 years he wasn't sent back to devil's island which is kind of lucky for him really uh question number six what percentage of the prisoners died in devil's island before the sentence was complete uh that's 75 percent and if, if you watch a film called uh papillon with um I think it's Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. That is based... So there was another guy who a couple of years later escaped from Devil's Island, and that's his story. But it's based in Devil's Island, and that's... So you, if you watch Papillon, um, that's what it's based on. It's based on uh, an escape from Devil's Island. Question number seven. How long was Roger in Devil's Island before he escaped? Three years. Question number eight. What country did the prison escapees flee to? was venezuela question number nine Henri bouclier the canadian white slaver was known as old martigues but what does that name make reference to it's the slang name for marseille which of course is a coastal town south of france which was his other nickname that he used which is relatively smart of him because it makes people think that he's french when actually he was belgian uh, and question number 10, what was the name of Roger's fellow escapee from Devil's Island and the other suspected 
and the other person suspected of killing Henri Bouclier. It was Rafa. So there we go. That was that. Cor Lummy. Uh, so that's me done. I'm going to... I haven't even got anything to... Oh, I've got some fish sticks. Yeah. I'm going to have some fish sticks. I'm going to go to Starbucks. I'm going to abuse their electricity. I'm going to start editing this. <gasps> ooh, ooh, dear. I'm going to start editing this uh, and then come back and finish watching more of Happy Valley. I've just got into Happy Valley. I don't like watching things when people say, oh, you have to watch this. I like to wait till it's died down and then I watch things to see if... Because I don't like hype. I think hype is BS. But I think... I like, to, I like to watch things when the hype has died down and then make the assessment myself. And I have to say, I'm really enjoying it. It's really good. I've, uh, I'm have i thoroughly gripped. And it, But it's funny watching season one with Steve Pemberton because immediately afterwards, I watch Inside Number 9. So every time, only people, people not in the UK might not get this, but when you watch Steve Pemberton in Happy Valley and then you watch him in Inside Number 9, you keep expecting him in Happy Valley uh and obviously prior to that, Psychoville, you keep expecting him to say, I've done a bad murder. I wonder if he had to say it. He actually said that on set at some point. I'm sure he did. Anyway, that's me done. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. That was episode uh, part eight of the Soho Strangler series. We've got two parts left. Core lummy. That's all I have to say on the matter. Have yourself a good week, folks. Stay safe and be good. Thank you for supporting the show. Best wishes. Lots of love. Bye-bye. Bye 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 bye